Hey, good Thursday morning, everybody. Welcome to the VolQuest Mailbag Podcast. I am Eric Kane alongside Grant Ramey, Brent Hubs, and Austin Price. Appreciate you guys for being here and sending in your questions as you do each and every week. And appreciate Exterior Home Solutions for being the presenting sponsor of this show. Uh, if you have a need, give them a call today at 865-524-5888 for a free consultation, for a free estimate, or uh, visit them online at ExteriorHomeSolutions.com. They've been local and trusted since 1999. All right, got a lot to get into. We'll just go ahead and jump into questions. We'll start with Vols by 1998. Who was leaving the football program when the spring portal opens, Austin Price? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, I'm sure there'll be one or two. Um, you know, I, at this point, I've not heard any distinct or definitive rumblings about any one particular player. Like, I've heard plenty of rumblings at other schools about certain kids. Uh, here, I've not heard that much. So, again, I would say there'll be one or two. Um, you just hope that uh, it's nobody that that really changes a room or or, or, or hurts the football team, um, you know. Because at the end of the day, Tennessee, you know, may need to bring in one or two. Um, and with with numbers a little tight, um, you know, it probably doesn't hurt if somebody that's not going to play that that is down the depth chart, um, you know, moves on. But I don't have any definitive names. We'll go to TB Vol Seven. If Rod Clark were to leave to go to Michigan. Is Barnes more likely to land, uh, more likely to see if, if Robert Lanier has any interest in coming back and, and or find an up-and-comer like Rod Clark was, Grant? Uh, actually, Rob Lanier is employed. He's the head coach at Rice. Um, he got fired at SMU, and they hired Andy Enfield, which kind of Rob Lanier led to, uh, I guess, Kentucky losing John Calipari to Arkansas. Uh, so, But, no, he would not be an option to fill in. But the good news is, I think, the longer this thing stretches out with Rod Clark in Michigan, and you don't hear anything. I think if Rod was going to Michigan, he'd be at Michigan right now. I agree so with the, long, the longer this stretches out, the more better news it is for Tennessee. And I don't know that they'll have a staff vacancy to fill because I don't think anybody's getting hired as a head coach. And like I said, if Rod was going to Michigan, I think he'd be there right now. Let's go to Swagger 12. Why do we never seem to hear anything from Dylan Lewis or Tyler Redman, even when they're in town? Are they still takes, AP? Yeah, I mean, they're commitments. <laughs> like... It just boils down to like, you know, and we'll have, we've got something on Dylan Lewis. Rob's wrote a story on Dylan Lewis. It'll come out later in the week. But when the kids come to town, who are the priorities? Do you want to hear from Dylan Lewis and, and George McIntyre? Or do you want to hear from guys that are not committed? Because I mean, like you've heard from the committed guys, they committed already. So like you, once a kid commits, you don't hear from them as frequent. That's, you know, been that way for years. Um, just because, I mean, like, they're ready to kind of be done with the interviews, right, Hubs? I mean, like, they'll do them, but, like, it's kind of like, once you commit, it's like, okay, <laughs> I'll do one every blue moon. Like, I don't need an update all the time. Yeah, and, what, and you know, what's the story? Hey, you're back for your 12th visit to help recruit. I mean, <laughs> what'd you learn today? I mean, I mean, basically, the, inter the, the interview you do with them is, or the conversation you have with them is, hey, who, who do you think you made inroads with? Yep. You know, who do you think you helped? Well, they're not going to go on record and say, man, I think I had a great day with player X, and I think we were in a great spot for him, you know, and mess up some other kid's recruitment. So that's just kind of how, how it goes on those weekends. But, yeah, we'll have updates on those guys, and they're definitely takes. Nobody's back. Tennessee's not backing off either one of those guys. We'll go to Volume Shooter. He has three questions, three different sports or three different programs. Why the Volume Shooter, baby? Volume shooter. <laughs> Shoot it your fits. shot, my friend. It fits. Um, football question. Brent Hubs will stay with you. Coming out of spring practice, which guys or position groups pleasantly surprised you? Did anyone disappoint or cause reason for concern? I mean, I, I think they've upgraded at the wide receiver spot, which is what you would were hoping to be the case. Um, but, you know, I think Chris brazel has been really good. Um, I liked his progression throughout spring. Uh, Mike Matthews, as you expect, has a ton of upside. Uh, Braylon Staley has been better than probably most people thought that he would be. I don't think he's going to jump in and take a bunch of squirrel white reps or, or snaps in games, but I think you like the upside there. To me, the biggest surprise out of that group is Dante Thornton. Yeah, uh, and, and it's it's just the way Dante Thornton carries himself. Dante Thornton's always had talent and ability, but he, he's playing with a ton of confidence right now. So on that side of the ball, I start there. Um, Ketzelman's been the biggest surprise, maybe offensively, with what he's done at the tight end spot as an individual. I didn't see that one coming. I thought he was basically an extension of a, of an offensive lineman, but I think he can certainly play in space more than you thought. And they're more athletic in the secondary, which you thought they would be. Um, but I still think they're 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 not not a, not a hundred percent settled back there. But uh, you knew they were going to be more athletic. I think they are more athletic than, than they have been 
Um, what that looks like ultimately, we'll, we'll have to wait and see. Again, spring's more about individuals for me, Austin, than it is position groups. You know, I think T. Lander, I, I don't know that the position group at linebacker is vastly different than you thought, but man, T. Lander seems like he's taken a really nice step from the end of last year to where he's at now. I mentioned Ketzelman. Um, I think you more look more towards individuals than overall arcing, you know, groups. I think Turrentine's been better this spring, but does that mean the secondary has been great across the board? I, I'm not saying that, but I, I think from an individual standpoint, a few guys stand out like, like that. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think that the, what you just said about the, I won't call it individualism, but it is about individuals, um, you know, and, guys. And, their, and their growth, you know, um, because, you know, you, you hear, you know, T Lander talk about, he could see growth from the end of the regular season to the Citrus Bowl. And now he's seen even more growth from the Citrus Bowl to now. Um, you know, I think that's where it, it more is about. Now, you could say from a position group standpoint, they've overhauled some groups. Like the, I think they're a lot more athletic, as you said, at wide receiver and in the secondary. And I think I think that's where you hope that newfound athleticism shows up in the fall. His next question is about basketball. Grant, big time roster flip incoming over under one and a half starters coming from the portal. Grant, who's the starting five? Who's the starting five, Grant? In two thousand probably under. Um, I don't know who the starting five is, but yes, you have five know. open slots as we're recording this. Five of thirteen. That's a pretty big flip. But at the same time, you're gonna have four seniors on roster in Zakai Ziegler. Uh, Jonas Adu is gonna be a senior, Jamai Meshack is gonna be a senior. Uh, Jordan Gainey is going to be a senior, and Rick Barnes, even though he throws in the cliche every single time, doesn't matter who starts, it matters who finishes games. It, it, he usually leans towards veterans when he does make a starting lineup. So I, I don't know what role Jemai Meshack plays in terms of if he's a starter or a bench guy, if he can kind of do a little bit of a Josiah Jordan James and play a four. Um, I don't know if Jordan Gainey starts in the backcourt. I, I, I don't know. But you're going to have to get some big-time production out of the portal, at least one starter. Um, if you could get two, that would be pretty good because it means you probably got two pretty good basketball players. I, and I, I, I kind of look for them. I don't know how Grant feels, but I kind of look for them to at least – like they'll probably add at least three to four guys out of the portal. Grant's talking about five spots. I think one spot is still going to go to a high school kid that they bring in that they can develop, like an Awaka Ziegler type player that they feel like, hey, this is a program guy. Give him two, three years, and he's going to be in that same form or fashion. Do you, are you, are, Grant? Are you more hesitant to do that in in this day and age with the portal? You know, I mean, because you did that with with Tobey, and Tobey's left now. Ziegler did not. I mean, and, and obviously Ziegler and Rick Barnes are attached at the hip. But which is more likely to happen in this day and age of college basketball? You get a development guy for his entire career, or you get a guy you develop a couple of years and he bolts to the portal. If you're a head coach, what's your thought process with that now? I think you're more hesitant to do that if your spots are limited. Like if Tennessee's only got three spots to flip fill right now, I would be trying to get three guys out of the portal. Sure. And you've got five guys. It's going to be hard to get five guys out of the portal that you like, that fits your program, your culture, all that stuff, the way they've treated the portal in the past. I mean, there's a huge emphasis, but they've never had to go out and try to get five of those guys. Now, with Zakai being an August edition and Tobey being a July edition in their respective classes, those are two huge success stories. Sakai obviously is one of the best point guards in the country and, and one of the best point guards in the program history. And, and for them to find them, find him the way they did that late in the cycle, that's huge. And Tobey was a pretty big success story too. He's a lot better basketball player than I gave him credit for when they signed him in July. And, and I think it's a little bit of a different circumstance with him leaving and maybe trying to get back closer to home or something like that, or cash in on, on how he played the last couple of weeks uh, in the NCAA tournament. But I think if you have five spots to fill, you have that luxury to try to add somebody as a developmental piece in a program guy because you have to have those four or five year guys in your program as part of it. You can't be relying on turning over the entire roster uh, every single offseason. On that note, though, Grant, there's nobody on the horizon, correct? Um, not really right now. I mean, there there have been some names I've heard in the last couple months, but you try to figure out which ones are realistic and, and if they're going to go down that path or not. But off the top of my head, no, I wouldn't throw a name out there at this point in the process. But I do think there are some possibilities, even though uh, I think the biggest emphasis, obviously, and it has to be, is on the portal. Yeah, do you wonder if a guy with a coaching change tries to get out of his letter or gets out of his letter of intent and maybe somebody pops up there as opposed to 
a guy in August or July that you find in a summer tournament that you didn't know anything about. You wonder if it looks that way a little bit with some of the turnover that's taking place around the country as well. So lots of different options. You, ne you also never know when a guy's going to reclassify, right? Right. <laughs> right? I mean, yeah. and, and, and it feels like it's just getting started because when you have a John Calipari leaving for Arkansas and opening up a job like Kentucky, I mean, if Scott Drew goes to Kentucky and Baylor comes open, then who does Baylor hire and all the kids that are, you know, tied to those schools that are involved in that coaching carousel, you know, they could hit the open market too. And it's just, it's already free agency and, and insanity. And it's, it's even more so when you have uh, jobs of that caliber coming open and getting filled. You never announced the starting five for next year. Yeah. Especially if people are going to hate it. My bad. <laughs> uh, Lady Vol still, still here on volume shooter. Again, the uh, name fits the question and I don't have an issue with that. Uh, Kim Caldwell feels like a Danny White hire. A lot of fans were hoping he'd go with someone more established with a track record at the Division One level. Was there less interest, Brent, in the job than first thought? Any insight into who else Danny spoke to? I don't know who all he formally spoke with. Remember, he used the Parker search firm to, to sign up, kind of see where the list is. Um, and, and that way you can always come back and say, well, we offered the job to one person. Um, right. This is our top choice. And, and, you know, that's kind of the PR play that, that you make. Now, Danny didn't say that yesterday, but that's kind of the AD's, you know, PR play there. Um, so I, I think the Parker search firm certainly reached out to a lot of people. Um, <clears throat> I, I don't know that they were lining up in droves for, for interviews with established coaches, you know, and for, for a variety of reasons. Um, one, some of them, I think were established at the places they were at and felt comfortable with their AD, felt comfortable with their compensation, and, and weren't interested in uprooting their family, you know, and, and, and moving. Um, you know, I, I think that was the case with uh, Coach Godley at, at, at Southern Cal. I don't think she was interested in moving her family, even though they're going to travel from coast to coast all winter long, you know, which you thought maybe might give them a chance, might give Tennessee a chance to get in there, but, but that wasn't the case. Um, I think there were some other people that were interested, but they were going to command – you know, that might be interesting, but they were going to command large sums of money, okay? And they probably weren't known well enough for anybody. I mean, if you hired them, they'd be like, man, you're overpaying for that because who is this person? Even though they had been, you know, to an elite eight at the program they were at. Uh, but, I mean, basically, if you polled women's, you know, you poll basketball fans, they probably know three women's coaches right now, right? Kim Mulkey, Don Staley, Gino Ariama. That's Kind of that's kind of it, right? And and Caitlin Clark's coach that nobody really knows who she is. She's just Caitlin Clark's coach. That's kind of where that's kind of where the sport is a little bit. Looter, baby, come on. You know, <laughs> uh, and so I, I think that uh, you also had a situation where if you just looked at it on the surface, and I mentioned this on the message board, if you just looked at the job on the surface and didn't do a deep dive, Tennessee let go of a coach who went to the Sweet Sixteen two of the last three years. Okay, the coach at Oklahoma has never been has never gotten out of the first weekend of the NCAA tournament. She's like zero and five, you know, in the first weekend of the NCAA tournament. She's been ousted in the second round every year that she's made the tournament. You know, she's looking at it, going, "Wait a minute, you know, they're, they're, they're look what they did there. Look at their expectations. My AD is comfortable with what I'm doing. I just got beat in the second round again. I'm getting ready to get a, a raise to take me over a million dollars. I'm pretty comfortable where I'm at." Um, Danny White said yesterday, he. You know, you wish that that Coach Caldwell had had more experience at the at the Division One level, but as he said, somebody was going to hire, her. Um, and and he believes in her, and and he thinks he's found a, an up and comer that's going to do well, and and time will tell. Um, so to answer his question, I don't know that they everybody was lining up for this job the way some people fans think that they would, um, but I do think there was probably more interest out there than just Coach Caldwell. I don't think she was the only option that Danny White could hire. Um, so it's probably somewhere in between. And Grant, I can't believe they hired someone with with no D one experience. Could you imagine the men's team doing that? That was uh, I could. That was that was something special. Like I, I don't understand. Like I think that's a compliment to Rick Barnes and how they've elevated the program to think that Tennessee is basketball has never hired a men's basketball coach that didn't have previous power. That's all they've hired. 95% of their hires in program history have been non-Power 5 head coach, yep. even assistant coach. I mean, there's no experience. I don't know. That's crazy. It was crazy. All right. We'll move on to some baseball here from Sam Smith. Uh, Kane, 3-9 and nine LSU, comes walking to Rocky Top. Dylan Cruz and, and the fraud Paul Skeens ain't walking through the door <laughs> with their backs against the wall. 
Do they have enough <laughs> pitching on Saturday and Sunday to give Tennessee problems? Um, I, I mean, if Tennessee's bats aren't aren't you know hitting, yes, um, I understand. I mean, I'll dive way more into LSU on the porch podcast in the preview, but I understand LSU's got a disappointing SEC record. There's still a lot of guys on that team that just won a national championship. There's still a lot of talent there. There's still a lot of guys kind of like Tennessee's freshmen that you thought needed to step up so they can be some players from Tennessee that just haven't yet. There's some guys that were freshmen, now sophomores, in that bullpen and that staff for LSU that really haven't taken that next step. So I'm going to say overall, the way Tennessee's offense is, I'm going to say no. But, of course, that's still putting a lot of pressure on your offense. Um, How much does A.J. Causey have for the Friday night spot before uh, they move him to the barn? Um, I'm not, at this time, I'm not 100% certain that he'll be the starting pitcher on Friday night. Um, Tony Vitello is not going to mention it. He will not tell anybody. Um, We'll see if we can kind of poke around a little bit. If there was a move to make, I think it would be an Aaron Combs and then piggyback in with A.J. Causey, maybe a Chris Stamos and then bring in A.J. Causey. Um, Or they can just roll A.J. Causey back out there. We will see. But at this time, at the time of this recording, I'm not sure that he will start. He'll pitch. I don't know if he'll be in that starting role, so uh, we'll keep tabs on that. But ultimately, he's got to pitch better, no doubt about it. And then, since you were an amazing catcher at the high school level, what do you make of Beam's <laughs> numbers with Cal and Peebles? I went back and looked, and some of the blow-ups for Drew Beam this year, they've come with both those guys behind the plate. He gave up six runs at Alabama with Peebles. He gave up four runs and five innings and a third with Stark against Ole Miss. Gave up seven runs with Stark as his catcher against Georgia. And then he pitched really, really well at Auburn um, with Stark as his uh, his catcher as well. So really, I mean, guys might have preference. That's why you see like personal catchers every now and again. They tried to have Charlie Taylor be the personal catcher for Chase Dolander last year. It just didn't work out. But overall, I think when Beam has struggled, it's been because of Beam. It's not really necessarily been – because of who he's throwing to, just my opinion. Didn't you hate that in the '90s when they take Javi Lopez out and they put in <laughs> Greg Maddox? Hey, hey, trivia question here. Anybody know Grant? You might know this. Anybody know Greg Maddox's personal catcher's name? Oh God, I've, I've, I've Kirby I've, Bucket. No, <laughs> Kirby. Bruce Benedict. I, I <laughs> give me the first believe, name. Give me the first name. Give me the first name. I believe it's Henry. Henry Rowan Gardner. <laughs> That's where I was going. <laughs> now, you had the you had the Perez the Perez guy was one of the catchers for the Braves back in the nineties. No, he was Eddie Perez, Eddie Perez Eddie for a Perez. long time. I believe it was Henry Blanco was the personal catcher for Hobby Low or for sorry for for Greg Maddox for years, and he kind of followed him. You know, Atlanta, Chicago, San Diego. Yeah, yeah, that's who I'm thinking of. Henry Blanco was his personal catcher for, for many, many years. This so. question from Austin underscore Price, Eric Kane. Um, is the Stamos guy akin to John Stamos? He is not, but Tony Vitello says that it's his uncle anyway. <laughs> we'll go to Corn from a Jar. You've already spoke on this a little bit, Grant, but he says, Tobe, why? Heartbroken and need answers. Not really a question, more of a statement, but... Uh, elaborate answers, a little bit Grant. more on Tobe Iwaka. Uh, he needs answers. Well, Grant was able to put him in his starting five. <laughs> I know. He, he, he wants, heard he about it and he left. He wants the truth. <laughs> Tobe was in that Monday night chat. He saw that potential starting five 24 hours after the season ended. He's like, I'm out of here. Um, I think maybe closer to home is part of it. Uh, getting back closer to New York now, of course, he could go farther from home, and I'd be looking like an idiot saying this, but I think that might be part of it. I think. Uh, cashing in on how well you played in the tournament might be part of it. Uh, I think wanting some more minutes might be part of it because you don't, you know, you can go somewhere where there's not a Jonas Adu and there's not a JP Estrella trying to get minutes too, and there's not a Cade Phillips, and you know it's a little bit crowded in the front court. Um, I don't think it's anything like. I, I don't think it ended poorly between Tobe and Tennessee. I think this was a tough decision for him to make, um, but I think it's just an opportunity he wanted to explore, and I'm sure he was getting pretty well hounded um, before he even entered the portal uh, from teams trying to get him and, and trying to give him that opportunity. That's not so allowed. It's, kind of, it's kind of the world we live in now. If you if you play well and your minutes are limited, people are going to come after you and, and try to throw some money at you and get you in their program. So it's kind of, I don't, I don't know. I know Tennessee fans hated to see it because they like Tobe and how hard he played and, and the brand of basketball he played, but this is the transfer portal, portal era. Kids are going to come, can, kids are going to go and 
you're going to get Dalton Connects and you're going to lose Tobey Walkers, and that's just kind of the, the price of doing business. Let's go to Vulcan. He says, I think we all feel that Vol football is in the upper tier of the sport and NIL funding. Where is Vol's men's basketball in terms of NIL for the players, Grant or AP or, or whoever wants to take this one? I don't, I don't think we know. I mean, right? I mean, you know, it, it, listen, the stuff that gets tossed out there, don't believe everything that gets tossed out there. Like, I mean, like all of these innuendos, you know, the apocalypse of the transfer portals coming after spring. And I, again, I know, I believe there are going to be kids move around. Probably a couple of the highly named kids. Do I think it's going to be mass chaos? I just don't. Maybe I'll be wrong. Basketball, when they're throwing out, oh, he's promised this and NIL and all this, yeah, I, I'm hesitant because I think a lot of that is posturing to, to you know try to look strong out there in the NIL world for recruits because it's still a recruiting pitch. You know, you want to know, hey, Arkansas's got five million dollars to put towards basketball. So I don't, I don't think anybody knows. I think Tennessee does well. I mean, I, you know, as far as what they spend on the players. But do I do I do I think that like we all know? I, I just don't. Well, and we we I mean we also don't know exactly where Tennessee's football budget is, right? I mean, it, 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 we're not what two years removed from the idea that Tennessee was spending twenty five million dollars a year or twenty million dollars a year in football and in NIL. I mean, there's just all kinds of stuff that's thrown out there, and there there's not transparency. You know, you're you're not FOI and contracts to see what everybody's making. So there's no way to squash the the rumors and, and the innuendos of who's making what and, and all this type of stuff. And if a kid's smart, guys, he doesn't tell everybody what he's making, right? I mean, he, he doesn't broadcast it to everybody what he's making. Just go about your business and, and do your job. I mean, I, I think Tennessee's fan base is pretty fanatical, and, and I think financially they're, they're positioned well in NIL. Does that mean they're leaps and bounds ahead of everybody else? I don't. I don't say that in any sport. The same way, I don't know that Cal's going to have six million dollars to play with at Arkansas in NIL money. You know, I mean, it's just there's all kinds of stuff just thrown out there because you can do that. There's not because there's not really any way to prove whatever gets thrown out there. There's no real way to disprove it. Does anybody else root for Cal just when they play Kentucky just to have his play with the Cats? Though, I mean, I you know. Yeah. I, I want that to happen in the worst way because they wanted him out of there in the worst way and they got rid of him. He left. You know, I want him to have enormous success against Kentucky. Do you know how many scholarship players he's inheriting at Arkansas? None, no. right? One, right now, one. Like, he better have money because he's got to fill an entire roster in very short order. I don't know that the answer. I don't know the answer specific to Tennessee basketball. I just know. Tennessee's willing to play ball. And they got to be because they got spots to fill. I mean, Freddie DeLeon was here for a year and a half, whatever it was. He made a lot of money. Like they're willing to pay guys. They're willing to play the game that they have to play to get guys here. And they're going to have to because they got a lot of uh, slots to fill and they're going to have to, you know, pay other guys to keep them happy and keep them here and all that stuff. They're, they're willing to play the game and they have to be if you're going to keep a, a competitive roster on campus. And by the way, quick note on Cal. Does anybody play the PR game better than he does? I mean the whole the whole video he did of like, hey, this program needs a new voice. I'll always be a fan. I'll always. I mean, like, like, I mean, come on, like, right? I mean, what? I mean, it was just. Uh, it's like, well done, well done, Cal. You make yourself the martyr out the door, right? People are tired of me. It's time for me to move on. I love you guys. <laughs> just gets well done. Also, knows full well that if he leaves his house. Someone will see him and come up to him. And so well, he did it like when he was walking the dog. Did you yeah, see that? <laughs> exactly. What's exactly. the score with the baby stroller? And that's a dog stroller, not a baby stroller. But the dog the wasn't dog in was, it. But the dog wasn't well, in it. I'm sure the dog's been in it plenty. <laughs> maybe there was a you second did. dog. Okay. This maybe maybe the undercarriage had NIL money, and that's how he delivered it. <laughs> there, was a, there, was a, there was a second dog on the grassy knoll. Maybe it had a there cooler full of Tyson dog. chicken in it, right? What if he had been doing that? What if he had walked down there and been like, this anti chicken is so good? <laughs> oh, I, or, or he pulled out his spot. Because that would have been too. I'll pull out. Guys, hey, look, I'm working on my Walmart app. I'm, I'm trying to order something. <laughs> what if he had a, the ultimate. If he had a foam hog on his head and said, no comment. No comment. Second part of the question here from Vulcan. This is football. Is Jason Jenkins going to be the next Dominic Bailey? Just a guy with no fanfare who can't get off the field. Well, Bailey gets off the field plenty of times because they play so many guys. But <laughs> to his point, Bailey doesn't have a whole lot of hype, Brent, and Jason Jenkins doesn't either. 
but it feels like he's a guy that continues to be brought up in conversation. He'll play this year. No, he's definitely going to play. He may, he may he may take some of Bailey's snaps when it all sudden. And we'll have to wait and see. I mean, Rodney Garner lo- loves Jason Jenkins because he goes to work every day, and Jason Jenkins is making himself into a guy who you have to put in the rotation, just the same way Dominic Bailey did a year ago. And I think both those guys are in there. In there, that strong side defensive end position is going to be pretty fascinating to watch. I mean, I think that that's where the, the most oars are going to be in your two deep when you put your two deep out after your first press conference the week of the first game where the coach doesn't have to talk about his two deep. But I Aside think from left guard. Have, I think it's going to have like seven oars by it, right? I mean, you're going to have Tyree West, and you're going to have an oar there with you know Dominic Bailey and an oar there with Jason Jenkins and you know an oar there with – you know, whoever else, I, I just think that 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 thing's going to be bracketed about four different ways. Um, and, and you're going to play all those guys at defensive end, including Jason Jenkins. Got plenty more questions, but first let's get a, a word from our proud sponsors, Exterior Home Solutions. Severe weather can strike at any time in East Tennessee and Mother Nature can do severe damage to the first and most important line of defense that you and your family have against Mother Nature. And that is your root. Whenever she strikes, make sure that you call the people that I call. Make sure you trust the people that I trust. And that's my friends at Exterior Home Solutions because they're more than friends, they're truly family. Be sure to, uh, and listen to our friend Mark Packer on top of his mansion there and contact Exterior Home Solutions if you... <laughs> You have a need for anything? Uh, number is 865-524-5888 and online at exteriorhomesolutions.com. That, that was just the pool house game. Just the pool house. That just was the just pool the house. pool house. Uh, let's go to I Miss Denarius Moore. Who is one under the radar, not Nico, Boo, Pierce, player uh, that we will all be talking about after the Orange and White game? Oh, it'll be Gadsden Moore or that's my <laughs> answer. It, 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 Hunter Barnes or so, somebody at running back. You know, probably Deshaun Bishop. I mean, I think Bishop will get a bunch, will get carries and and he'll put up some yards. You know, to where fans will probably feel a little bit better about the running back position when it, when it's all said and done. Um, you know, I mean, it might. I mean, it could be a Caleb Webb or I mean, you just never know with, with a spring game. I mean, you know, you had how many years did you have a walk on running back? You know, be the MVP of the spring. Maybe Yancey, baby. Yancey, Kirsten Biggers. I mean, Biggers. I, I, listen, I mean, I, I think I think spring games or whatever they are. I, I don't. I think most coaches would like to do away with them if you could. I think PJ Flex onto something by turning your spring event into an NIL event and basically a barbecue picnic day for your fans, uh, so they can interact with your team. I, I don't. I don't know that anybody's trying to accomplish a whole lot in the spring game. You got a two hour television window where you're trying not to show anything, right? Like they probably won't do a red zone period in the spring game. Will they AP? We can't shoot it if they do. <laughs> I mean, you know, so I, I just, you know, I, I'm not trying to de- diminish it or demean it, but I, I just think that you're not going to see a ton of Nico. You're going to try to get, you're going to rest a bunch of guys and you're going to get some guys off the field as quick as you can. Um, you know, w- when you're talking about what this thing looks like. So I, you know, I don't know that there's going to be somebody come out of there that you're all talking about. Who's going to be a huge factor this fall, unless it's a guy like Deshaun Bishop as the running back to kind of bridge the gap to Cam Seldon gets back. In. Way more important to get in and out and be spending time with guys like David Sanders than, you know, be, you know, spending a whole lot of time out there trying to do anything on the football field. I'll throw in any of those DBs. Uh, Boo Carter, Jamal McCoy, um, you know, do they make any plays Saturday as well? And I think Spillman will probably show up at linebacker too, because it'll be simplified. You're not going to have a ton of re. I mean, he's just going to go see ball, hit ball, and I think he'll see ball and hit ball a lot. It's Edwin Mays Hayes. That's what we're going with. <laughs> Edwin Mays Hayes. What if Get Josh Hopple grabbed the microphone and said, "Excuse me, SEC Network, can you show alternate programming for the next <laughs> seven minutes? We got to run some plays in the end zone." <laughs> What if instead of an NIL event, they change it to a mixture of an NIL event like a fantasy camp where you give $5,000 and you can try to pass that against James Pierce? <laughs> Sign some waivers. You can get on the field. We'll strap a, gro- a GoPro to your head. You can have that highlight forever. Here's me trying to block. Bobby oh, Smith from Warburg <laughs> tore his ACL when trying to do a kick step against James Pierce on Saturday. The EMTs are standing by. <laughs> Let's go to Atheron. He's got a couple of questions. AP mentioned that the Lady Vols need more NIL investment. 
Was AD Danny White not willing to back Coach Harper as much because it wasn't as higher in terms of advocating for NIL donations to the Lady Vols? AP, I don't think that's the case, right? No, Danny doesn't control NIL donations. Like, no. that's on, you know, that's on Booster Club to go out and fundraise. Um, uh, you know, and, and I, I do think they're going to be, you know, doing some more stuff with, uh, you know, with Spire and the Volunteer Club on the women's side than they have been, um, you know, to try to help out, you know, the Lady Vols. But I mean, you know, the, you know, for my liking, I think it boils down to, you know, it still boils down to, to fundraising. And, you know, I think that's, you know, that's not on Danny White. Danny White's not doing the fundraising for for NIL. Danny White can encourage fans, hey, if you want to give, give to Booster Club, give to Spire, give to whoever, right? He can't, he's not going to go out there and, and pick up the phone and make all these calls. That's on the collective to fundraise. Um, you know, but again, he can encourage. It's good for him to encourage so the fans know he backs the collective and he's back to collectives. Well, and I think this too, I mean, r- remember, I mean, part of it's just getting organized. I mean, C- coach Harper was here when NIL came into play. I don't think any of us knew the impact NIL would have in, in women's college sports. We all knew football was going to be a thing, right? But we all knew college men's college basketball was going to be a thing, but how big of an impact would NIL really make, you know, in, in, in women's sports and in women's basketball? I mean, I don't think anybody said, all right, NIL's rolling in. You know, Angel Reese is, you know, going to make whatever she ended up making at, at LSU. Um, so I think that there's a bit of a catch up in, in the sport um, because I don't think Tennessee was necess- and, and Kelly Harper was necessarily prepared for the impact NIL would have uh, in that in, in the game in terms of, you know, the fact that, you know, kids were just going to openly ask for some money. I, I don't know that anybody thought it would happen that fast in women's basketball as it has. So part of this is just getting organized too um, and, and, and getting, getting a plan. And I don't know that they've been the most organized thing at this point. Which freshman do you think sees the most snaps that are not on special teams? Edwin Spellman, Boo Carter, Mike Matthews, Braylon Staley, Peyton Lewis, or someone else. AP, I think this comes down to Mike Matthews, Boo Carter, most Peyton men. Lewis. I'll probably say, if healthy, those are big gifts, though. Like Peyton Lewis got to come in and earn it right in fall because he missed spring. So I'd probably say Boo Carter or Mike Matthews. Yeah, those two. I, in fact, I don't think it would be close as far as like, potential playing time. Who was the best no name recruit that uh, has come that you've seen come through here at UT that turned into a solid, good player for the Vols? So a no name recruit that turned into a dude. Before he, before he got injured, Inky Johnson. Yeah, Inky Johnson will be at the top of that list because nobody knew who Inky Johnson was. Kelly Washington would factor into that as well. He was a walk-on that just showed up here. Nobody knew who he was either and what he was about. Um, those are kind of the two that that jump out to me immediately. Now, I mean, l- listen, they, they had some offensive linemen, the Sullins twins. Nobody nobody knew they would even play, you know, and they ended up playing that whole year. They can kill them. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you've had some guys like that. But in terms of stars, I mean, Inky Johnson was going to play in the NFL – had he not gotten hurt. And obviously Kelly Washington went from the baseball field and nobody knew who he was to the, to the national football league and set a few records along the way for Tennessee. Then do it the opposite direction hubs, guys that came in as, as a superstar that no one ever saw. AJ Peterson, Dontavious Blair, Brian yeah. Darden, OJ Owens. I mean, we can keep going right down the list, Hubbard. Yeah, JJ Peterson watch. They're, they're, I mean, that's why recruiting is a, is not an exact science. Exactly. I mean, you know, you just never know how somebody's going to develop uh, or adapt once they get away from home um, and, and all those types of things. That, that's that's the that's the hard part of figuring out recruiting when you're dealing with with 85 guys, and um, you, you know, you're going to win some and you're going to lose some, and you certainly for every one you win, you can look at you know you lost probably more than that uh, along the way. I might have mentioned this last time I was on the podcast, but when they Brought in Zakai Ziegler on a visit, and I looked up who Zakai Ziegler was. The first thought in my head was, you've got to stop taking projects. <laughs> Way to go, Grant. <laughs> stop taking projects. And not only is he one of the best point guards in college basketball program history, he's completely 100 million percent changed your program and your roster and, and all of it. So, yeah, yeah. And, and, in, in exact science to an extreme. Yeah, and, and I think Zakai is one of the, one of the more – extreme stories that way. I mean, Inky Johnson was a guy everybody was kind of watching, you know, and, and would you have a spot for him? You know, I mean, he was going to be a preferred walk on at Georgia because they didn't have room. Tennessee didn't have room. And then they ended up getting a spot late and that's why they landed him. So they knew who he had been for several months. 
I mean, Zakai Ziegler is a guy who showed up at the Peach Jam and 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 left with a basically left with a Tennessee offer who had nothing going in, but and, and coming out. I mean, that, that was a absolutely we don't know who you are. Oh, by the way, come on, you know, type of a, right. identification. That that was a crazy one that way. Hey, let me add one more to that. Uh, the, the ones that came out of nowhere, Cedric Tillman. I mean, didn't have anything. Now he's in the NFL. Yep, I mean, like, you know, I mean, it's a great one. And to, he was uh, a throw in, right? That is correct. And yours truly sat in the office with one Jeremy Pruitt one time and told him, do not put him back in the game. Mostly because they only put him in when they blocked. Like it was the stupidest thing. Don't remember that? Like he would only come in to block. And then he ends up going to the NFL because he got a chance to catch the football. Yeah, absolutely. Speaking of baseball, a little while ago, uh, J.L. Vall says, Seeing that there are only two SEC players inducted to the Baseball Hall of Fame, can we honor ours by placing a Major League Baseball Hall of Fame designation on Helton's number and the outfield wall? Um, no clue about that. Absolutely no clue. He also says it would also be nice to invite him for a ceremony. I can tell you Todd Helton will be at Tennessee, and they're going to honor him before Saturday's game. So Saturday is going to have a lot going on on the campus of, uh, of Tennessee. Um, they're going to honor his uh, Hall of Fame induction. So before the game on Saturday – Against LSU, that is when you'll see that. Also, um, sidebar, the one eighteen and three jersey numbers that are retired but not really retired, they're going to be out of circulation starting next year when they get New Jersey. So they will officially be retired. Those one eighteen and three jersey numbers. And I think you'll see as the stadium renovations finish next year with all that they've got to do. I think you will see. Um, so, something more dedicated to Todd Helton. I don't know yeah. exactly what that's going to look like, but there will be something more dedicated to Todd Helton besides a a, a screen or a, a sticker of a jersey out in the outfield or or whatever that thing is. I mean, I think you're going to see something more in depth there uh, with the stadium renovations. Would love to see a pennant somewhere. I mean, I I, I love pennants, you know, for baseball. Not not necessarily for Todd Helton, but hang the pennant, you know, somewhere that'd be nice. Um, even have the statue up on campus. That's what I want. That'd be even better. Be down there next to the steam plant. <laughs> Vol Forever wants to In know the, the, steam plant. <laughs> the real story on why DJ Burns transferred. Grant, take a swing here. Uh, I'm not going to sit here and trash DJ Burns five years later after the run NC State just went on. Um, it was a bad fit. It was a mutual parting of ways. It was a bad fit. Um, He's a really. They knew he's a really good basketball player when he's on campus. Um, I don't. He's not going to get to the size he got at NC State and Winthrop and still be a factor in Tennessee's system. Now the spot that DJ opened up turned into Santiago Vescovi, and there's not many players you could trade for DJ Burns and think it's a success and a, and a pretty easy win. That's an easy win. I mean, what Santi did here for five years and and the way he impacted the program. Like you're going to take that trade every time now. That's not to discount DJ Burns because he had a great career. He's a great basketball player, and it was really cool to to watch him and that NC State team go on that run, and, and for him to kind of be the face of the tournament for um, for a few weeks. But at the same time, it, it wasn't something that was going to work out at Tennessee, and, and that's fine too. Got a couple more here before we'll call it quits. Let's go to Andrew Aikens. Outside of Lance Hurd, John Campbell, Dane Davis, which tackle is most ready to help this team? AP. Hmm. It's a good question. Great question, and, good, I don't think, and I don't think we know the answer to it. Yeah. What about Carl from Wartburg who showed out <laughs> in the NIL uh, <laughs> fantasy camp? But, but, but give Carl, him, give him the jersey. Yeah, I, I think I think the interesting thing there is if they had a rash of injuries at that position, do they bump Sham back out and try to play him at like right tackle, or do you look at Jesse Perry and go, man, you got to figure it out quick, and we've got to try to help you in, in order to try to survive? You know, because he's probably their fourth tackle right now. If you just went, everybody stays at their position and you went too deep, too deep, he might be their fourth tackle, but I don't think anybody thinks he's ready to play right AP, now. AP, for a guy that never took a, a kick step before, you know, spring, I would imagine probably bumping Sham back outside, right? Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I'm telling you, I'd have no clue. Yeah, I don't know either. I, I'm I'm spitballing. Marcus Tatum still here? Uh, <laughs> what? Does Marcus hey, 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 now is the time, Amari Thomas. Flip over. Well, yeah, that's the best offensive tackle on the roster. Actually, I would say Hurd is, but now it used to be Omari Thomas. And he and I tell him that all the time. 
Second part of this question, was there expected to be this much turnover on the basketball team? What is the goal in getting five new guys? Example, point guard, um, three and D wing, rim protector. Um, Grant, who are they going after in the portal in terms of top of player? And was all this turnover? We get the kid from Indiana State. That's what I want. Uh, no, I, I assume he's a shoe in at St. Louis, but if he could, that would be uh, amazing to, to cover that kid on a day-to-day basis. Uh, is that is this amount of turnover expected? Uh, Freddie wasn't coming back. You knew that just based on how the last year and a half went. DJ Jefferson, you know, you probably didn't expect him back, but even if he came back, is he going to help you a ton next year? Because we haven't seen him do anything in, in the two years that he's been here. Uh, Tobe was a guy that there, there were some rumors there. I mean, I had a story ready to go on Tobe because of those rumors, and you never know. And I wasn't going to put his name out there unless he entered the portal, but it's just what it is these days. You just kind of try to be ready for who you think might go. Um, outside of that, I don't, I don't know. If somebody else enters at this point, I think it would be a surprise. So I think the amount of turnover so far has kind of somewhat been expected um, in terms of a, a maximum number scenario. Uh, who they're going? They're going. They're, they're not going to find a Dalton Connect, but you better find a couple guys that can help replace that twenty-five a game you had in SEC play and twenty-one a game you had for the season. Um, Darlington Stone Dubar is a guy at Hofstra uh, who's probably coming in on a visit this weekend for the orange and white game. He's a guy that scored it, you know, twenty-something a, a game at Hofstra. He's a six-eight, two hundred kind of wing guard, kind of in that similar mold. I think you need, might need a big guy now that Tobey's gone. Uh, another body down there. Um, I don't know. Wing scoring is the, the biggest emphasis for sure. I wouldn't hate another point guard to add some depth there, but I'm not sure they're going to go in that direction. I mean, who would be the point guard? If, 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 I guess Mayshack, just because he did it last year. Well, uh, uh, Jordan Ganey. Ganey will be a ball handler option. I mean, Zakai is going to play 33 minutes a night if he's healthy, and and, and, the, and for good reason. Um, but outside of him, yeah, I guess Ganey, I guess Mayshack, Bishop Boswell is going to be a guy that's going to get here and you're hopefully going to let him sit for a year and, and see what he looks like uh, two name. years from now. Um, he's a he's a he's a football player that that turned into a basketball player in the last couple of years. So it's it's going to be a little bit of a, a process there getting him, I think, ready to go at this level. So if, if you can get by with with sitting him, but I, I would I would still look for a point guard option if there's one out there available. All right, we got three more. Let's run through them here as we uh, we say goodbye here on the podcast. Pine says. Any chance we see a deeper than a three wide receiver rotation this year with depth, maybe rotate a series at a time? I don't know about You're, rotating a series at a time, but I do think they play more players. Yeah, they're going to play more than three. be great to see, but in years past, that hadn't happened unless they you didn't have to. that They didn't have more than three to play in years past. They didn't have options. I mean, I mean, look, I mean, you look back two years ago, I mean, they basically benched Holiday and – um, Callaway because they didn't they didn't catch the ball and that's when they went with three, but that, they that, they've not had a room like this. They they have to play more than three and they will yeah. play more than three. They definitely not had a room like this. Davy Vall says, "Are you surprised the staff likely won't pursue a running back in the portal? Do you think any? Um, do you think they pursue any other positions after this spring?" Again, I think as of now, I don't have them taking a running back. I don't think they fully decided one way or the other. Um, you know, there, there are some options there. You know, there's some rumors out there um, that if a particular player went the portal. Problem is, again, we talked about this on the message board, like how Tennessee, you know, looks at, you know, the value of, of certain positions is maybe different than other schools. So, you know, it, are they willing to invest in a running back like that? I'm not sure they will be, um, especially if Deshaun Bishop continues to practice well and they feel like Cam Seldon is progressing and Peyton Lewis – um, you know, same thing. So, I mean, you know, again, I'm not sure on that. As far as other positions, however, I mean, I just don't see him going with an offensive lineman. You know, I don't – I mean, I wouldn't rule anything out, you know, when you look out there as a possibility. Um, I, I wouldn't think that they – surely they can find a guard out of what they have on that roster, a, a left guard. Um, but I guess you never know. I think the challenge with running backs is, like, if the rumors are out there true about the Martinez kid from Oregon State – and he's walking away from four hundred thousand dollars at Oregon State. I mean, he, he wants to get paid, right? Are, are you going to pay five six hundred thousand dollars for a running back for twelve games? No, I, I don't. I don't think that. I don't think that Tennessee is going to do that. So, um, and then he gets back to do you take a body just to take a body, or do you feel like Deshaun Bishop is as good as any body that you would take out there if you're not willing to spend big, big money for it? And, and yeah. again, that's why Josh Heupel makes what. Couple hundred thousand dollars a week, 
I mean, make that decision. That's your call, not my call. I can speculate on it, but that's why you get paid the big bucks to make that kind of call. Last question. Chances Coach Inge uh, is the next defensive coordinator if, if Coach Banks leaves for a head coaching position. Seems like a possibility of that happening. Might be one of the reasons he declined Alabama to come to Tennessee. Your thoughts? I think it's a possibility. I would not call that the favorite, though. All right. Great stuff, as always, here on the VolQuest Mailbag Podcast. Sorry to all the questions we didn't get to, but I uh, appreciate you guys sending those in over on the General's Quarters each and every week. Big thank you, as always, to our friends over at Exterior Home Solutions. They've been local and trusted since 1999. If you need a new roof, new siding, windows, repairs, renovations, whatever the case may be, contact Exterior Home Solutions at 865-524-5888 or online at ExteriorHomeSolutions.com. We've got... Basketball offseason. We got football spring practice. The Orange and Wide game coming up on Saturday. We got tons of recruiting. We got baseball. There's no better time right now to join us on the VolQuest uh, at VolQuest.com because it's you, you get bang for your buck, right, Brent Hubs? I mean, we're, we're the standard in the market and we got a lot to offer right now. No question. You said it best, Tennessee. We got it all covered. So uh, come check us out. If you're not uh, checking us out, you're missing out on, on a ton of coverage and a ton of insight and um, and some fun too. So be sure and check us out. If you're not a part, we'd love to have you be a part of it. There's a lot of things going on this month and that's going to be the case basically all, all year long because there's always something going on in Tennessee athletics. And if you're watching on YouTube promo code on the screen right now, it's a, it's a great deal right now that you can join us over at VolQuest.com, a special YouTube promo deal. If you're watching on YouTube right now for Austin price, Grant Ramey, Brent hubs. I am Eric Kane. Thank you so much for joining us here on the VolQuest mailbag podcast.